Jesus, I surrender. Show me what I'm
Hello, good morning, and thank you for joining us here at Day Spring Cypress Church. I'm Pastor Peter, and I'm just so happy that you're here with us today to worship the Lord. And I pray that the Word of God will get deep inside your hearts and start transforming your life. And I pray that that starts with you today. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's all bow. If you're with somebody, then hold their hands. But let's all go to the Lord and ask Him to speak to us today. Father, thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving us life. Thank you, Father, for giving us freedom, Father God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you allow us to come after you to see who you are, Father God, through your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that everyone that is listening today will seek you, Father God. I pray that just for the next little while, Lord, that we'll put all of our problems, our thoughts, our emotions, Father God, all our temptations aside, and truly, Father God, focus on you and your word. Lord, I pray that you would use me today I pray that you'll move me out of the way and that your words will speak through me, Father God, reaching down and penetrating the minds and hearts of the people listening today. Father, I just thank you for all your blessings, Father. I thank you, God, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So happy 4th of July. This is the weekend that we celebrate our independence. We declared independence from the oppression of England. And here we are over 244 years later, and we still have the opportunity to choose the life that the Declaration of Independence said. So we're going to read the second sentence from the Declaration of Independence because it's going to help us to focus for our message today. It says this, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, these are natural and legal rights for all Americans. And today though, we're gonna focus on the spiritual rights for all Christians. And how are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that through the Word of God, amen? So let's go to Colossians chapter three, and we're gonna read verses two and three. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. This is how we do this. This is how we focus on the spiritual rights of all Christians. Think about the things of heaven, the Word of God says, not the things on earth. For you die to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen. So how do we live this uh, life, this spiritual life with the spiritual rights that we have? Think about things in heaven and not things of the earth. Look, we live in the greatest country. We do. And we are the most blessed people in the world. Even with all the craziness going on right now, with everything happening, we still live in a wonderful, great country that gives us the freedom to choose how to worship and to do things under the liberty that the, the law provides for us. But you know what? Unfortunately, not everyone will live the blessed life that Jesus died on the cross for. So I'm hoping that today you'll start understanding what he died for and we can start living it. So let's take a look at what the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence said, that we have the unalienable right to live with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness 
but we're going to do it from God's word, God's perspective. Amen? So the first one, life. Well, for us Christians, it's the spiritual life. The spiritual life of a Christian should be described by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and peace. Listen, some people are just miserable in life. You may know people like this, but they're all over the place. In the U.S., the Center for Disease Control reports that more people die from suicide than from murder every single year. Over 775,000 Americans attempt suicide every single year. Why do they do that? Is that the life that our forefathers died for? Is that the life that our Savior died for on the cross? No, it's not. They do this because they're helpless. They're hopeless. They have severe mental, severe emotional, and severe physical pain. Millions of Americans suffer from these types of things, these extreme and constant pains. You know that there are over 1,500 clinics in the U.S. that deal just with those types of pain? And the numbers every year keep going up. Why is that? It's because we're not tapping into the spiritual right that God died for our, us on the cross to live. We're not tapping into that. We're not understanding it. And we're not living the life that he intended for us to live. One of the big reasons is people's lives are filled with so much drama. It's caused by addictions. It's caused by inappropriate relationships. It's caused by immorality. But really, it's just caused by sin. And because people have this in their life, some just don't want to live. So they attempt suicide. And even if somebody here that's listening has an attempted suicide, our lives are death. Our lives are living in darkness because you live that life of sin. So let's stop doing that. Let's start living the life that Jesus died for. Because I'm going to tell you all that other stuff, it's a lie. It's all a lie from the enemy. He wants to steal your life. He's wanted it from the beginning, and he's going to want it until the end of time. But listen to what John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus warns us about this. And this is what he tells us. He says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And then Jesus makes this declaration right here. He says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus wants us to have an abundant life. The enemy, he wants to steal our life. Listen, the thief that he's talking about, that's the devil. The devil is the one that's behind the drugs. He's the one behind alcohol. He's the one behind addictions. He's the one behind adultery. He's the one behind lying. He's the one behind anger. He's the one behind depression. The enemy is the one behind sin. So if you want to live the life that Jesus died for you to live, you must live in the Spirit. A life in the Spirit will be the life that God intended for you to have. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to read verses 5 and 6 in Romans chapter 8. Romans, great book in the Bible. It's called the book of faith. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So let's break down verse 6 for just a moment. Carnal minded. What does that mean to be carnally minded? It means that's a person with their mind that's focused on the sensual things of this earth. The devilish things, really, and devilish desires, such as sex, depression, money, selfishness, pride, ambition, and anger, just to name a few. But to be spiritually minded, it's real simple. The spiritual minded person focuses on Jesus and his commands. That's it. His commands are written in his word. And if you pick up his word, and you believe his word, then you will be, you will be spiritual, spiritually minded. A spiritual minded person follows Jesus. And what do they experience? 
they experience liberty. Liberty is freedom. They experience the liberty that comes with spiritual living. And this leads us to the second thing, the second spiritual right that we have as Christians, which is liberty. And liberty is this for a Christian, freedom from our sin. Freedom from the past, freedom from the enemy, and freedom from ourself, really. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It's a, one of the, in the New Testament from uh, the great apostle Paul. He says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, stand fast. Some of your versions may say, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What this means is he's saying stand firm into your faith. Stand firm holding on to what Jesus died for on the cross because he, he is the one that gave us liberty. He is the one that made us free from being slaves to sin. And then he says do not get entangled again. What he's saying is don't go back and do again what you used to do. Stop doing those things. Stop sinning. Repent from those sins means to turn away from those sins and turn to God. Serve Him. This is how we live a life of liberty. You will never be free. You will never have a life of liberty in Christ if you keep going back and doing the same old things that you did before you had an experience and before, you, before Christ. You just won't. You'll be in bondage. You'll want to be free, but you'll be like a bird that has one wing tied to a chain and the other wing just trying to flap. You won't be able to fly. Let's stop being like that, brothers and sisters. Instead, let's turn away from the sins, repent of those sins, and let's let God spread those wings and fly so we can go and be free with our Father who is in heaven. This is very important. On the second part of this, when he says, do not get entangled again, he's saying, do not go back to that life of sin, that life of slavery. This is important because, you know, it gets worse when you go back and sin again. Once you are in Christ, and you go back and try to do something that you did before Christ, the conviction comes upon you. The guilt, the shame, the consequences are even worse. You know, and some people, they've experienced freedom in Christ. Some people have been freed from all addictions. Some people have been freed from so many things in their life, but yet they go back again and again and start sinning. Why is that? You see, because they're not living the spiritual liberty they're not living the spiritual life that Jesus died for. Paul tells us this. He says, listen, once you're free, stay free. Once you live in freedom, continue to live in freedom. You don't have to go back and do the things that you've done. The temptations will come. People will ask you. People will tempt you with things. The enemy will tempt you and say, hey, you know what? You've, you've been reading the Bible long enough. You've been going to church long enough. You can go ahead and handle going to the bar again with your friends. The enemy will tell you something like this. Why don't you go back to the bars that you used to hang out with, all the people that you met, and maybe you can convert them to Christianity while you drink with them. That's a big lie from the enemy. You try to go back and live the life that you had or that you lived before, you're going to die. It leads to death. But the spiritual life, it leads to peace. And it leads to a life that God has intended for us. So it's very important that you understand that. Do not get entangled again. Because sin, it kills your freedom. Wrath, lying, adultery, unforgiveness, addictions, all of these sins, they destroy you and all the people around you. Some people think, man, I'm going to sin and it's just between me and God. No, it's not. It affects the people all around you. The consequences just keep going out. See, there are consequences for your sins. There's natural consequences, there's legal consequences, and there's spiritual consequences. The thief on the cross, I believe, is the best example of this. I've talked about this a little bit, but understand this here. When Jesus was on the cross, there were two, th two thieves behind him, uh, next to him. One was making fun of him, and the other one defended him. The one who defended Jesus said, remember me, when you enter, when you leave here, Lord. And Jesus looks at him and he says, I promise you that this day you will be with me in paradise. Now see, people look at that and say, okay, man, so with my last breath, I can declare Jesus as my Lord and Savior and he's gonna save me. And yes, 
Jesus did save him spiritually. But he had natural and legal consequences. He was hanging on that cross for a reason. He was a thief. That means he stole something. Or whatever it was that he did, the consequence for that was dying on the cross. And when they came, when it came time to take them off the cross to see if they were dead, what did they do? Man, those Roman soldiers, they chopped the knees and the legs of that thief. He still had to die and suffer the consequences of his sin. And it was an excruciating death. Yes, now after that death, he's in paradise with our Lord and Savior. He's not going to think about those pains anymore. But I'm telling you this so that you understand. When you're a believer and you sin, there's a consequence for that sin. Whatever's in the darkness will be exposed in the light. Jesus is light. He is the light of the world. And so for you to get closer to him, for you to get closer in your ministry, for you to get closer to your spouse and all these things, that light is going to shine into those dark areas. And there's going to be consequences for things that you've done. It's the natural, legal, and spiritual law of things. It's just the way that it is. And if you're, you think that you've done all these horrible things and you profess to, that God is your Lord and he is your Savior, that you're not going to face the consequences of those things, you're fooling yourself. And here's what happens. When we fool ourselves as Christians, we turn away from Christ when we start experiencing those consequences. We start thinking, well, okay, then I must have not really given my life to the Lord. Or maybe God really didn't forgive me. Or maybe he forgives everybody else, but not me. Maybe I said the sinner's prayer wrong. Maybe I didn't get baptized right. Maybe I did it too soon. Maybe I, all of these things. What you're failing to understand is if you get convicted of murder, and your sentence is life in prison, if you give your life to Christ during the trial or once you're in prison, you're still going to have to serve your term. Life in prison. That's a natural and legal consequence for the sin that you created. If you've destroyed your family through adultery, if you cheated and lied at your job and you lose your job for those things, whatever the case may be, Whatever sins you committed, as long as you're alive on this earth, there's consequences for those things. Now, here's the great part. You might look and say, well, then what's the point of giving my life to Christ? Because you're not going to be on this earth forever. We have one or two destinations, brothers and sisters, heaven or hell. Hell is going to be a continuation of all the pain and suffering. Heaven is going to be where there's no more pain, no more suffering. You'll be with other believers surrounded in love and loving our Lord and Savior. You see, so the life of eternity is the spiritual right that Christians have. So don't be fooled in thinking that everything is wiped away. Does Jesus look at it? Of course. He wipes it away. He says he remembers not. He throws it into the ocean as far as it is. He loves us as far as east is from the west. Jesus does those things. And he'll move some things out of your way. But there are still consequences for the things that you have done, no matter how long ago it was. It could have been 20 seconds ago, 20 years ago, or 50 years ago. There are consequences. And this is what I'm hoping that everybody understands, that when Jesus came and he died on the cross, he died to free us, to free us eternally from those consequences. As long as we're alive, we have to face what we've done. That's just the natural order of things. But Paul says, listen, once you're free, remain free. That means don't go back and do the things that you've done. To live in spiritual liberty means that you have to live in Christ. You have to live in Christ. You have to live in Christ. There's no other way around it. Romans chapter 8, verse 2, it tells us this. For the law of spirit, excuse me, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. This death is the eternal death that we're talking about. The law of the Spirit in Christ has made me free, has made you free. So you can look forward and have hope that you know what? Yes, I messed up. I've done all these things. I've ruined my future. I've ruined my marriage. I've ruined my family. I've ruined my job. I've ruined all of these different things from the choices and the decisions and the sins that I've made. But here's my hope. Christ died for me on the cross. I believe what he died for. And because of that, I have the opportunity and I will be with him forever in all eternity in heaven where there is no more of this. 
there is no more death, but there's the life that he lived for us to have and the life that he died for us to have. Amen? Pursuing Jesus, pursuing him, chasing after him, makes us free from those chains of sin and death. Will you pursue him? Do you want to pursue him? Because this leads us to the third thing, the third spiritual right, which is the pursuit of happiness. There's not a whole lot of places in the Bible where it talks about being happy. Happy is more of an emotion, but there are scriptures that deal with being happy. True joy, the joy of the Lord, is what's going to cause us to be happy. So that's the spiritual right that we're going to be seeking and looking for today. And it's something that you have to look at every single day. St. Augustine, he said this, Every man, whatsoever his condition, desires to be happy. I got to tell you, you know, as a pastor, nobody has ever called me up and said, Hey, pastor, you know what? Man, I've been having a great year. Can you tell me how I can become depressed? It's never happened. Nobody's ever said, I really need a counseling session with you. I just think I'm too happy about things all the time. And I want to be more angry. I see people in, with road rage and I don't know why I don't have it. I'm just praising and worshiping God and I'm singing. So I think I need to be angry. Nobody asks me for those types of things. Why is it? Because we all have a desire to be happy. We have a desire for peace. We have a desire for joy. We have a desire for love. And let me tell you this. There's no person that can make you happy. No one. But Jesus makes us happy by giving us his joy. And he gives it to you freely. All you have to do is believe in him and follow him. And he will give you his joy. Sometimes we make a mistake in marriages and in relationships where we put that on the person that we're getting married to or in a relationship with. Make me happy. Make me happy. Make me happy. When you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. That relationship will be either miserable or it will not last. But you see, Jesus, he wants to make you happy. He wants to fill you with his joy. And when you accept that and you start pursuing that happiness, then everything around you, everything else and everyone else will also bring you joy because the joy of the Lord is inside of you. Let's go to God's word and see what it says about being happy. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 20. This is how we can pursue happiness. It says, he who heeds the word, meaning listens and follows. He who heeds the word wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. So the first way that we pursue happiness is to trust in the Lord. Because a person who trusts in the Lord will always, always be happy. Job chapter 5 Verse 17, Job 5, 17 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise discipline of the Almighty. So someone who gets disciplined, not punished. Discipline is for correction. Punishment is so you can feel pain. Discipline is to teach you a better way so that you don't do it again or teach you how to do something. So he's telling us that a person is happy, a man is happy, who God corrects. If God is disciplining you, that means that you're his child. He won't waste his time with you if you're not. If he doesn't have something for you, if he doesn't want to teach you something, he won't waste his time for you. So be happy, rejoice when God disciplines you. Listen, nobody likes to be disciplined or corrected at the time. But if you can get to a point of maturity, spiritual maturity, where you can look at that situation and say, man, you know what? Thank you, God. You made me stronger. You made me wiser. You grew me up during this. You made me more mature. Father, you humbled me during this time. Father, thank you for walking. I mean, when you start getting like this, happy are you. You will be happy. Look at the next one here. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 21. Proverbs 14, 21 says, He who despises his neighbor sins, but he who shows mercy to the poor, happy is he. So the third way that we pursue happiness and the joy of the Lord is to show mercy to the poor. Now, it's not just the poor financially. It could be the poor in spirit, the poor in health, the poor in mind, 
the, and yes, for sure, the poor financially, but the poor. The poor is someone who, has, who doesn't have something that you have. The poor is someone who has something less than what you were blessed with. So show mercy to them. Help them. Be kind. Be gentle to them. Don't be judgmental to them. Show them mercy because God has shown you mercy. And when you start showing mercy, when you start allowing or rejoicing in the discipline, and when you start trusting God, then you are pursuing happiness. And when you pursue Jesus, he's going to fill you with his joy. Let's go to the fourth scripture. It says, James chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Behold, we count them happy who endure. Happy is the person who endures. Endures what? Man, endures this life. If you haven't figured it out by now, your life is going to be filled with heartache, heartbreak, trauma, all of these things. It's going to be filled with bad things, hard things, things that will rip your heart out and tear you apart, things that will send you spiraling down into darkness, things that will cause you to be depressed and want to sleep all day. This life is horrible because we live in a fallen world. But here's the great news. What I meant was life, the earthly life will be like that. But the spiritual life, even though you encounter all of those same things, you're going to encounter all those same things, you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you to overcome. To know that I may feel down and depressed today, but tomorrow's a new day. I'm going to have hope for tomorrow. I know I may be sick, but one day I'm not going to be sick. Either I'm going to get cured by the doctors, cured by the Lord here, or I'm going to be cured when I have my new heavenly body. You see, these are the things that cause us to be, have hope. So when we endure these things, meaning we don't give up, we don't try to end it, we don't try to quit, we don't try to walk, walk away from a marriage, walk away from a job, walk away from a ministry, but we don't try to walk away from those things that we know that God has blessed us with, then we are enduring. And when we endure, we will be happy. We are pursuing happiness because we have the joy of the Lord inside of us. Amen. The last scripture on the pursuit of happiness is in Psalm 144, verse 15. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. What that means is those who believe Jesus is God. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Those who believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. When you believe that, you're happy. You're happy because you know that your faith is in the right place. You're full of joy because He fills you with joy. You are pursuing happiness, which is really pursuing Jesus. When you pursue Jesus, He will give you the life that He's promised you. He will fill you with happiness and he will give you the liberty that comes from being free in Christ. It's obvious. It's obvious, brothers and sisters. To find happiness is to pursue Jesus. Are you pursuing him? How hard are you pursuing him? If you're down and depressed, pursue him harder. If you think, well, I just read five minutes a day. I, I, I read my devotionals. I read my scripture each morning. I pray at night. Well, then... If you're still depressed, if you're still not happy, if you're still not filled with the joy, then do twice as much. Do three times as much. Read 15 minutes a day. Pray in the morning and the afternoon and at lunch. Read 30 minutes a day. Start helping, start serving, start doing something in God's kingdom so that his joy will fill you. Start mentoring people. Join a Bible study. Join a group study. Start one. There's so many things to do in the kingdom of God. So many things that will start to fill you with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Listen, brothers and sisters, Jesus died to give us believers life. He died to give us liberty. And he died so that we could pursue happiness. That's him. So celebrate it. Celebrate it. Thank him for it. Don't waste it. Don't waste another day. I gotta tell you, I'm almost 50 years old and I don't know where the first 50 years of my life went. I mean, I can look back and think of things. I can remember when I was in middle school or high school and it seems like it was just maybe a couple of years ago, 
That was a long time ago. We're talking over 30 years ago. Time went by like this in the blink of an eye. There's no time to waste. So don't waste your time being miserable. Don't waste your time with unforgiveness. Don't waste your time being angry. Don't waste your time being a slave to sin. Don't waste your time depressed. Don't waste your time doing things that God's word says not to do. Chasing people you shouldn't be chasing. Hanging around with people you shouldn't be hanging around. Doing things that you know God didn't intend for you to do. Stop wasting your time. Instead, start celebrating the life, the liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that God gives us those spiritual rights to have. We're believers. We're Christians. It's a spiritual right for us to live a spiritual life, spiritual liberty, and have joy that comes from the Lord in our lives. If you believe in Jesus then you have the right to have that blessed life. You can have a blessed life with endless liberty, full of happiness. If you're with me on this, if you're with me with this, say, Lord, I'm ready right now. Let's say it together three times. Lord, I'm ready right now. Lord, I'm ready right now. Lord, I'm ready right now. Thank you, Jesus, for the life that you have given me. Go to him. Seek him. Live the life that he died for you to have. He came. He died on that cross. He rose again on the third day. He ascended into heaven. He sent his Holy Spirit to live here with us and live inside of us so that we could live like him. Let's start living like God. Let's start living like Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Let's all bow in prayer right now. Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. I thank you, God, for the message that you have given us today, Father. It's a message of, of life. It's a message of liberty, Father God. It's a message of happiness, Lord, to those who receive it. I pray that the people's minds and hearts truly receive this message today. I thank you, God, that if anybody out there is struggling with depression, Father God, with suicidal thoughts, Lord, with anger or resentment, Father God, I pray that you would start to work in their lives this moment, Father God, right now. I pray that someone would touch them, Lord, hug them, send them a message, go visit them, something, Father, that they would receive good news this week. If people are having financial problems, Lord, emotional problems, physical problems, Lord God, I pray that this week, Father, is their healing. This week is the beginning of their healing, the end of their healing, or it's in the middle of their healing, Lord Jesus. You were healing yesterday, you are healing today, Father God, and I know you're going to heal tomorrow, for you are the great healer. And Father, I just thank you, God. I thank you for this wonderful ministry, Father, day spring that you have given us, Father. I pray that the people will continue to seek you, Lord, that they will continue to get closer to you, Father, to not fall away from you and fall in back into the sin that they lived before. Father, I pray that instead they would turn their lives over to you this time, right now. As we look at this pandemic that's going on, Father God, and all these, this craziness that's happening around the world, Father, I just pray for your blessings of peace, Lord, and strength over us. I pray that your light would shine through us believers so that we could shine it out to the rest of this dark world. So many people are falling away. There's so much chaos, Father God, because the people are not looking to you for the answers. You are the answer. You are the life. You are the peace, Father God. You are the way to the Father. You give us everything that we need, Lord. Your word is truth. So, Father, I pray that we would believe it, Lord, and that we would spread that light and spread your life to the rest of this world. Help us to do it, Father God. If any believers here, Father God, are falling into the trap of the rest of the world and acting and doing the things of the rest of the world, I, wait, I pray that today, Father, that you would break those chains. We're not supposed to act like the rest of the world. We're not supposed to think like the rest of the world. We're not supposed to do things that the rest of the world is doing. We are supposed to do, act, and think like you do, Father God. And the only place we get that is from your word and from your Holy Spirit. So, Father, I pray that we will be led by your spirit, that we will show mercy, show kindness, show compassion, show forgiveness, Father, that we would pray for those who oppress us, that we pray for the enemies, Father God, pray for those closest to us and treat them the best, Father God. I pray that we would give our lives to you, Father, in every way, humbling ourselves, bowing down before the creator of the universe, Father, which is you. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. So, Father, I just thank you again for surrounding us in your love, for giving us the strength we need, for comforting us when we're in pain. I thank you, God, for breaking us free from those chains of slavery, chains of sin. Your blood shed on that cross was the price 
that you paid for us. I pray that today we will respect it, we will honor it, we will thank you for it, and we will start living, living that spiritual life that you have for us. We thank you, Father, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise to you all. We thank you guys again so much. Stay tuned for some special announcements coming up. We have some very special announcements. Um, and we just thank you again. From, on behalf of my wife, Michelle, and I, I just want you to know that we love you. Jesus loves you. We look forward to seeing you again. Stay strong in your faith. Don't waver. Stand firm knowing who Jesus Christ is. Let him be the Lord and Savior of your life. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. God bless you, Dayspring. Here is the Zoom information for the Children Ministry meetings that occur at 2.30 p.m. every Sunday. They will not be having one this Sunday, but they will continue next weekend on July 12th. We are excited to announce that starting July 8th, Pastor Peter will be hosting a Bible study every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. If you have any other questions or need more information, feel free to call or text him. According to Leviticus 27.30, a tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain or fruit, is the Lord's and is holy. Thank you for your continued support. Although we are not meeting at church, our contribution to helping others and keeping the building going is still in effect. May the Lord bless y'all and keep y'all healthy and safe during these times. Y'all have a blessed week.